result of everyone tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be uh, serving as a partial moderator and filming the event. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight and thank you for coming. The college consists of the following format. There will be a brief announcements period, then we'll have our speaker who will speak up to an hour, then after that we will have a question period, and then after the question period we'll have an FMS rebuttal period where you get a chance to generally speak up to four minutes on a subject, on or off topic. And uh, I just got one more word of note though. If anybody says political change can't come to Chicago, we are a two-party town. Sucks. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Justin Tucker, Chair of the Libertarian Party of Chicago. His presentation is going to be on Frederick Bastiat and the Law. The brief is the law first published as a pamphlet in 1850 is already more than 100 years old. Frederick Bastiat was a French economist, statesman, and author. He did most of his writing during the years just before and immediately following the revolution of February 1848. This was a period when France was rapidly turning to complete socialism. As a deputy of the Legislative Assembly, Mr. Bastiat was studying and explaining each socialist fallacy as it appeared. And he explained how socialism must inevitably, inevitably degenerate into communism. But most of, the, of his countrymen chose to ignore his logic. The same situation exists in America today as it did in France of 1848. The same socialist communist ideas and plans that were adopted then. Oh, I'm so stuck. I'm sorry. That were adopted then. Are now sweeping America. Let's welcome to our our, our esteemed podium, Justin Tucker. I want to thank the College of Complexes again for hosting me. My name is Justin, uh, Chair of the Libertarian Party of Chicago. Uh, I want to especially thank Charlie Paydock. He did a hell of a job promoting this event by creating some graphics. Yeah. And we use that ourselves in our uh, promotional uh, materials. So thank you, Charlie, for what you do for free speech in Chicago. Speaking of email campaigns uh, and promotional materials, you can join our email list at tinyurl.com slash LP Chicago subscribe. You can also follow us on social media. And as I mentioned uh, in the uh, announcements, we meet first Tuesdays at the Piggery on Irving Park Road. Um, first Tuesdays. Um, I want to invite my libertarian friends who are here today to uh, come up and do a rebuttal yeah, during the rebuttal period. You don't actually have to rebut anything, but if you can come up and speak about uh, the virtues of liberty as Bastiat did, uh, that'd be great. Um, now I'm here to discuss the 19th century French economist Frederick, Frederic Bastiat uh, and his classic work, uh, The Law. Okay. Should we have your laptop? Yeah, I'll set that, Justin. Yeah, it's good. Um, uh, let me provide a trigger warning for you guys. Uh, Bastiat's words may cause great anger. Uh, may provoke you guys to deep thought, and uh, there are heavy criticisms of socialism, protectionism, and communism throughout. So if this offends your sensibilities or could uh, trigger uh, a medical or psychological um, sort of uh, issue, I, I, I hope you guys... Uh, would see your way out. Uh, I also will have some trouble mispronouncing some French words, I guarantee it. 
Uh, the bio biographical details that I got from for this talk mostly came from a book called Frederic Bastiat, A Man Alone by George, uh, George Charles Roche III. Uh, and there's also some good uh, lectures by a historian named David Hart, which you can find on YouTube. So let me begin. Claude Frederic Bastiat was born June 29th, 1801, in the port city of Bayonne in the southwest of France, near the end of the First French Republic. He was the son of the merchant Pierre Bastiat. After, his, after the death of his mother in 1808, Bastiat and his father moved to the family estate in Magron, France. His father died in 1810, leaving him an orphan, and he went on to live with his grandmother and his aunt, Justine Bastiat, whom he loved very much. He bounced around from schools, uh, school to school before settling at the school in Soris. Uh, where he learned his first bit of English. He left school at 17, went back to Bayonne to work with his merchant uncle, who was also his father's partner. It was during this time in Bayonne, which was a port city, that Bastia was able to see the effects of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the effects that the Napoleonic Wars had on the economy. Trade and regulations stymied economic growth. It was also during this period that he studied the works of Adam Smith and John ba uh, John Baptiste. In 1824, Bastia returns to Magron to be with his ill grandfather, uh, who happened to pass away the following year, leaving the estate to the 24-year-old 24, 24 Federic. He uh, had tenant farmers, uh, as he wasn't very good uh, nor interested in business, and preferred to study. 1830, he married Marie uh, Hilliard, a local woman. And this brings us to the July Revolution of 1830, uh, which disposed of King Charles X and brought his nephew, Louis, uh, Louis Philippe, to power. Uh, Louis Philippe tried to be a modern sort of reformer, um, and he wanted to rule France in a more uh, Republican fashion. Bastiat returned to Bayonne to participate in the revolution. He and hundreds of others uh, were willing to take the garrison in, in Bayonne by force, but this proved unnecessary as uh, the troops in the local garrison basically celebrated and welcomed, welcomed the revolution. Upon his return in Magron, he was made a Justice of the Peace in 1831, and in 1833 he became a member of the General Council of Long. As he continues his existence in Macron, he also began to see the effects of the tariffs and the protectionism in France, with Euro France especially affected. Bastiat began to publish pieces in uh, 1834 about his thoughts about protectionism and tariffs. He also didn't immediately gain traction as a writer, and it was around this time that he discovered the work of Richard Cobden, who was the namesake of the town Cobden, Illinois and uh, the Anti-Corn League, which he founded. In 1844, the academic journal The Economistes published his study on the French and English tariffs, and Bastia finally found a claim as a writer. He continued to contribute to the journal and began, began a correspondence with Cobden. In 1845, he traveled to Paris and to England to meet with free trade leaders. That year also saw the publication of his work, Economic Sophisms. In 1846, he organized the uh, Free Trade Association. After he, after being granted approval from the French yeah, government, I'm and finally Richard Cobden was brought to Paris. The association hosted meetings and published educational materials, while their associations were spring, springing up okay. around France. Okay. Later in 1846, he established the Libre Echange with his seminal Petition of the Candlemakers, where his seminal Petition of the Candlemakers was first published. This mock letter to the Chamber of Deputies asked the government for protection from the sun for France's artificial light producers. Bastiat's work began to be translated into other European languages as the free trade movement began to exhaust itself in the lead up to the <coughs> February Revolution of 1848. Growing disparities in wealth and other frustrations came to head, and Louis Philippe is removed in the Second French 
Republic is established. All kinds of factions make up the Second Republic, including emboldened socialists. Later in 1858, Bastiat was elected deputy to the National Assembly and soon became aware of the impending demise because he had tuberculosis. He then dedicated his final months sounding the alarm about the sophistry of protectionism and socialism. 1850 saw the publication of the law, which had become his most famous work. 1850 also saw the publication of his most famous essay, What is Seen and What is Unseen, which articulated the concept we now know as opportunity costs. On Christmas Eve 1850, Bastiat died in Rome. And this brings us to the law uh, and the primary focus of this program. <laughs> Now, uh, my copy of the law is a 1850 English translation by Dean Russell of the Foundation for Economic Education. The, as the organization is called, continues to distribute copies of the law to this very day. According to Bastiat.org, the fee translation introduced headlines every few paragraphs that are not present in the original text. I was disappointed to learn that, but those headlines sure do make for good headings for PowerPoint slides. I'm also going to quote many passages. I don't care. Bastiat's treatise to me is like a sacred text. I will be doing some preaching. Many of these passages have ellipses. It's very tough for me to leave out certain pa uh, phrases while quoting, but I'm working within a time limit. So I implore you all to read the law for yourselves and feel the power of Bastiat's words. Now the law begins like this. The law perverted, and the police powers of the state perverted along with it. The law, I say, not only turn from its proper purpose, but make it follow an entirely contrary purpose. The law became the weapon of every kind of greed. Instead of checking crime, the law itself guilty of the evils it has supposed to punish. If this is true, it is a serious fact, and the moral duty requires me to call the attention of my fellow citizens to it. Bastiat then goes on to describe something akin to natural law. As a Roman Catholic, he believed that life was a gift from God, physical, intellectual, and moral life. To shape life, the Creator gave us, quote, marvelous faculties, and believed that when we apply our faculties to natural resources, we produce things that are useful to us. Quote, life, faculties, production, in other words, individuality, liberty, property, this is man. And in spite of the cunning and artful political purses, uh, political, uh, Artful political leaders, these three gifts of God precede all human legislation and are superior to it. Life, liberty, and property do not exist because men made laws. On the contrary, it was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that caused men to make laws in the first place. What then is law? It is a collective organization of the individual right to self-defense. Each of us has a natural right from God to defend his person, his liberty, and his property. For what are our faculties but the extension of our individuality? And what is property but an, extinction of our, but an extension of our faculties? If every person has the right to defend himself, even by force, this person, his liberty, and his property, then it follows that a group of men have the right to organize and support a common force to protect these rights constantly. Since an individual cannot lawfully use force against the person, liberty, and property of another individual, then the common force, for the same reason, cannot lawfully be used to destroy the person, liberty, and property of individuals or groups. If this is true, then nothing can be more evident than this. The law is the organization of the natural light of right of lawful defense, and the substitution of a common force for individual forces. And this common force is to do only what the individual forces have a natural and lawful right to do, to protect persons, liberties, and properties, to maintain the right of each, and to cause justice to reign over all. Bastiat believed he founded a nation on this prescription of the law. Order and order would prevail among the people. And there would be the most simple, easy to accept, economical, limited, non-oppressive, just, and enduring government imaginable. But unfortunately, no law confines itself to its proper functions. And when it has exceeded its proper functions, it has not done so merely in some inconsequential and debatable matters. 
The law has gone further than this. It has acted in direct opposition to its own purpose. The law has been used to destroy its own objective. It has been applied to annihilating the justice that it was supposed to maintain. By limiting and destroying rights which its real purpose was to respect. The law has placed the collective force at the disposal of the unscrupulous who wish, without risk, to exploit the person, liberty, and property of others. It has converted plunder into a right in order to protect plunder. And it has converted lawful defense into a crime in order to punish lawful defense. How did this perversion of the law be been uh, accomplished? What have been the results? The law has perverted the influence of two entirely causes. Stupid greed and false philanthropy. Now the word plunder is used over 50 times in, uh, in the English translation. Uh, and it comes from the original French spoliation, which uh, Bastia used. Spoliation, or plunder, is thus a major theme of the piece. Bastia points out that there is a tendency among, amongst men to live at the expense of other people. The annals of history bear witness to the truth of it. The incessant wars, mass migrations, religi religious persecutions, universal slavery, dishonesty in commerce and monopolies. This fatal desire has its origin in the very nature of man, and that primitive, universal, and insuppressible instinct that impels him to satisfy his de desires with the least possible pain. Bastiat says men will rebel against plunder either peacefully or by revolution, and will enter into making laws. They will either stop the lawful plunder or wish to share in it. Woe to the nation when this latter purpose prevails among the mass victims of lawful plunder, when they in turn seize the power to make laws. Bastiat then goes on to describe the legal result, the, the results of legal plunder. It is impossible to introduce into society a greater change and a greater evil than this the conversion of the law into an instrument of plunder. What are the consequences of such a perversion? It will require volumes to describe them all. Thus, we must content ourselves with pointing out the most striking. In the first place, it erases everybody's conscience, uh, from everybody's conscience the distinction between justice and injustice. No society can exist unless the laws are respected to a certain degree. The safest way to make laws respected is to make them respectable. When law and morality contradict each other, the citizen has the cruel, obje uh, the cruel alternative of either losing his moral sense or losing his respect for the law. These two evils are the equal consequence, and it would be difficult for a person to choose between them. The nature of law is to maintain justice. This belief is so widespread that many persons have erroneously held that things are just because the law makes them so. Thus, in order, plunder appears just and sacred to many cons consciences. It is only necessary for the law to decree and sanction it. Slavery, restrictions, and monopoly find defenders not only among those who profit from them, but also among those who suffer from them. Bastiat then explains the fatal idea of legal plunder. Quote, under the pretense of organization, regulation, and protection or encouragement, the law takes property from one person and gives it to another. The law takes wealth of all and gives it to a few, whether farmers, manufacturers, ship owners, artists, or comedians. Under these circumstances, then certainly every class will aspire to grasp the law, and logically so. Bastiat then uses the United States as an example of how legal plunder can corrupt a society. Is there any greed, is there, excuse me, is there any need to offer proof that this odious perversion of the law is a perpetual source of hatred and discourse, that it tends to destroy society itself? If such proof is needed, look at the United States. There is no country in the world where the law is kept more within its proper domain, the protection of every person's liberty and property. As a consequence of this, there appears to be no country in the world where the social order rests on a firmer foundation. But even in the United States, there are only there are two issues, and only two, that have always enda enda endangered the public space. What are these two issues? They are tariffs and slavery. These are the only two issues where, contrary to the general spirit of the Republic of the United States, 
law has assumed the character of a plunderer. It is most remarkable that this double legal crime should be the only issue which can and perhaps will lead to the ruin of the Union. It is indeed impossible to imagine a more astounding fact than this. The law has become an instrument of injustice. And if this fact brings terrible consequences to the United States, where the proper purpose of law has been perverted only in the instances of slavery and tariffs, what must be the consequences in Europe, where the perversion of law is a principle, a system? Bastiat's uh, prediction came true for both the United States and Europe. Uh, in this day and age, slavery is illegal. Uh, tariffs, on the other hand, Bastia then goes on to describe two types of plunder. Quote, for there are two kinds of legal plunder, legal and illegal. I do not think illegal plunder, such as theft and swindling, which the penal code defines, anticipates, and punishes, can be called socialism. It is not the kind of plunder that systematically threatens the foundations of society. The law itself conducts this war. It is my wish and opinion that the law always maintain this attitude toward plunder. But it does not always do this. Sometimes the law defends plunder and participates in it. Sometimes the law places the whole apparatus of judges, police, pris prisons, and gendarmes at the service of the plunderers and treats its victim when he defends himself as a criminal. In short, there is legal plunder. But how is this plunder to be identified? Quite simple. See if the law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives it to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of the other by doing what the citizen itself cannot do without committing a crime. Then abolish this law without delay. For it is not only an evil itself, but also a ter uh, but also a fertile source of further evils because it invites reprisals. If such a law, which may be an isolated case, is not abolished immediately, it will spread, multiply, multiply and develop into a system. Now, legal plunder can be committed in an infinite, infinite number of ways. Thus, we have an infinite number of plans for organizing it. Tariffs, protection, benefits, subsidies, encouragements, progressive taxation, public schools, guaranteed jobs, guaranteed profit, minimum wages, a right, a right to relief, a right to the tools of labor, free credit, and so on, and so on. All these plans as a whole with their common aim of legal plunder constitute socialism. Bastiat does not mince words. He goes right for the heart, and these words to me are pure poetry. He continues, Socialists desire to practice legal plunder, not illegal plunder. Socialists, like all other monopolists, desire to make the law their own weapon. And once the law is on the side of socialism, how can it be used against socialism? For when plunder is abetted by the law, it does not fear your courts, your gendarmes, and your prisons. Rather, it may call upon them for help. It is not considered sufficient that the law should be just. It must be philanthropic. Nor is it sufficient that the law should guarantee every citizen the free and inoffensive use of his faculties for physical, intellectual, and moral self-improvement. Instead, it is demanded that the law should directly extend welfare, education, and morality throughout the nation. This is the seductive lure of socialism. And I repeat again, these two uses of the law are in, con in direct contradiction of each other. We must choose between them. A citizen cannot, at the same time, be free and not free. Now, oops. now Bastiat pointed out three systems of legal plunder. It has been pointed out, however, that protectionism, socialism, and communism are basically the same plan in three different stages of growth. All that can be said is that legal plunder is more visible in communism because, because it is complete plunder, and in protectionism because the plunder is limited to specific groups and industries. Thus it follows, 
of, of the three systems, socialism is the vaguest, the most indecisive, and consequently, the most sincere stage of development. But sincere or insincere, the intentions of the person here are not under question. Bastiat reminds us that law is force. Since the law organizes justice, the socialists ask why the law should not also organize labor, education, and religion. Uh, Charlie, I thought I was plugged up in here. Uh, or not Charlie, uh, Tim. Tim. Uh, Is it I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. Uh, since the law organizes justice, the socialists ask why the law should not organize labor, education, and religion. Why should not law be used for these purposes? Because it cannot organize labor, education, and religion without destroying justice. We must remember that law is force, and that consequently, the proper functions of law cannot lawfully extend beyond the proper functions of force. When law and force keep a person within the bounds of justice, they impose nothing but a mere negation. They oblige him only to abstain from harming others. They violate neither his personality, his liberty, nor his property. They safeguard all of these. They are defensive. They defend equally the rights of all. Bastiat goes on. Law is not the breast that fills itself with milk, nor are the lactine veins of the law supplied with milk from a source outside the society. Nothing can be either nothing can enter the public treasury for the benefit of one citizen or one class under the citizens of another class has been forced to send it in. Socialism, like other ancient ideas from which it springs, confuses the distinction between government and society. As a result of this, every time we object to a thing being done by government, the socialists conclude that we object to its being done at all. Yeah. Bastiat's words give me chills, am I right? Now we come to my favorite part of the book, and this is the part where Bastiat points out that socialism is not a new idea. He argues that it's an ancient idea, and he goes on to criti criticize many uh, of the figures that influenced uh, the thinking in his day. Quote, Open at random any book on philosophy, politics, or history, and you'll probably see how deeply rooted in our country is this idea. The child of classical studies, the mother of socialism. In all of them, you will find this idea that mankind is merely inert matter, receiving life, organization, morality, and prosperity from the power of the state. And even worse, it will be stated that mankind tends toward degeneration and is stopped from this downward course only by the mysterious hand of the legislator. Conventional classical thought everywhere says that behind passive society, there is a concealed power called law or legislator, which moves, controls, benefits, and improves mankind. First, he cites a man named Bolsuet, a French bishop, theologian, and member of the court of King Louis XIV, who praised the Egyptians' use of law to instill patriotism and religious reverence, and it forced its citizens into certain professions and gave them a purpose. Next, he cites Francois Fenelon, another French bishop and theologian who looks to the, who looks to the magicians, but also, also to the Greeks specifically the mythical mentor of the Odyssey, who believed people should be ruled by a wise king, and Midas, the first king of Crete, who believed citizens could become virtuous and selfless through education. Next he quotes the philosopher Montesquieu, who believes that law should favor commerce, that law should divide the fortunes of commerce, then redistribute wealth from the rich to the poor. Yeah. Of this, Bastiat commented sarcastically, thus the laws are to dispose of all, for the, all fortunes of all fortune. He continues to quote Montesquieu. Looking at the Greeks specifically, Lycurgus, who made Sparta into a military state, and Plato, who recommended common ownership of property. Bastiat writes, those who are subject to vulgar infatuation may exclaim, Montesquieu has said this, so it's magnificent, it's sublime. As for me, I have the courage of my own opinion. I say, what? What have, you ner what have the nerve to call that fine? It is frightful, it is abominable, 
These random selections from the writings of Montesquieu show that he considers persons, liberties, property, and mankind itself to be nothing but materials for legislators to exercise their wisdom upon. Next, Bastiat oh, takes oh, on Rousseau, like who he sarcastically referred to as the supreme authority of the Democrats. Uh, that's with the lowercase d. Bastiat, or excuse me, Rousseau believed, quote, the legislator is the mechanic who invents the machine, the prince who is merely the workman who sets it in motion. The legislator must direct society, considering the circumstances of that society and the individuals as part of a whole. Bastiat's comments, it's a, I think I'm okay, I'm almost, I'm, I'm towards, uh, I'm getting, I'm, I'm at the climax of what I'm talking, so. So, uh, it's all right, Tim. Why does he not see that men, by obeying their own instincts, would turn to farming on fertile soil, or to, com or to commerce on extensive and easily accessible coasts without the interference of Lycurgus or Rousseau, who might, e might easily be mistaken? He quotes a few other thinkers and says, quote, actually it is not strange that during the 17th and 18th centuries, the human race was regarded as an inert matter, ready to receive anything, form, face, energy, movement, life, from a great prince or a great legislator or a great genius. These centuries were nourished on the study of antiquity, and, the, and antiquity presents itself everywhere, in Egypt, Persia, Greece, Rome, the spectacle of a few men molding mankind according to their own whims, thanks to the prestige of force and fraud. Bastiat then quotes a few leaders and thinkers of the First Republic after the 1789 Revolution, with the most criticism aimed at Robespierre, uh, Robespierre who said, quote, the principle of the Republican, ver Republican government is virtue. That means required to establish, and the means required to establish virtue is terror. Bastiat writes, this mass of rotten and contradictory statements is extracted from a discourse by Robespierre in which he aims to explain the principles of morality which ought to be a guide to revolutionary government. Note that Robespierre's request for dictatorship is not made, is not made for the purpose of repelling a foreign invasion or putting down the opposing groups. Rather, he wants dictatorship in order that he may use terror to force upon the country his own principles of morality. He says that this act is only to be a temporary measure preceding a new constitution. But in reality, he desires nothing short of using terror to distinguish from France selfishness, honor, <laughs> customs, manners, fashions, vanity, love of money, good companionship, entry, wit, sensuousness, and poverty. Of, ba of Napoleon, Bastiat wrote, quote, It is of course not of all surprising that this idea would have greatly appealed to Napoleon. He embraced it ardently and used it with vigor. Like a chemist, Napoleon considered all Europe to be material for his experiments, but in due course, this material reacted against him. He then goes on to quote the socialist uh, and labor organizer Louis Blanc, who was a contemporary of Bastiat in the French Second Republic, who said, quote, in our plan, the state only has to pass labor laws by means of which industrial progress can and must proceed in complete liberty. The state merely places society on an incline. The society will, downslide, will slide down this incline by mere force of things and by the natural workings of the establishment mechanism. Bastiat replies this by saying, the strange ph phenomenon of our times, one which will possibly astound our descendants, is the doctrine based on this triple hypothesis, the total inertness of mankind, the omnipotence of the law, the infallibility of the legislator. These three ideas form the sacred symbol of those who proclaim themselves totally democratic. The advocates of this doctrine also profess to be social. So as far as they are democratic, they place unlimited faith in mankind. But so far as they, as they are social, they regard mankind as little better than mud. Let us examine this contrast in greater detail. And in this section, Bastiat begins to wind down and conclude. He says, the claims of the organizers of humanity raise another question which I have often asked to them, and which, so far as I know, they have never answered. If the natural tendencies of mankind are so bad that it is not safe to permit people to be free, 
How is it that the, ten the tendencies of these organizers are always good? Do not the legislators and their appointed agents also belong to the human race? Or do they believe that they themselves are made of a finer clay than the rest of mankind? Yes. These organizers maintain that society, when left undirected, rushes headlong in the inevitable destruction beyond the instincts of the people who are so perverse. The legislators claim to stop the suicidal course and to give it a saner direction. Apparently then the legislators and the organizers have received from heaven an intelligence and virtue that place them beyond and above mankind. If so, let them show their titles to the superiority. Please understand that I do not dispute their right to invent social combinations, to advertise them, to advocate them, and to try them upon themselves at their own expense and risk. But I do dispute their right to impose these plans upon us by law, by force, and to compel us to pay them with our taxes. I do not insist that the supporters of these various social schools of thought renounce their various ideas. I insist only that they renounce the, the one idea they have in common. They need only give up the idea of forcing us to acquiesce to their groups and series, their socialized projects, their free credit banks, their Greco-Roman concept of morality, and their commercial regulations. I ask only that we be permitted to decide upon these claims for ourselves, that we may, be not, that we may not be forced to accept them, directly or indirectly, if we find them to be as contrary to our best interests or repugnant to our consciences. But these organizers desire access to the tax funds and to the power of the law in order to carry out their plans. In addition to being oppressive and unjust, this desire also implies the fatal supposition that the organizer is infallible and mankind is incompetent. As long as these ideas prevail, it is clear that the responsibility of government is enormous. Good fortune and bad fortune, wealth and destitution, equality and inequality, virtue and vice, all depend upon political administration. It is burdened with everything, it undertakes everything, it does everything, therefore it is responsible for everything. If we are fortunate, then government has a claim to our gratitude. But if we are unfortunate, then government must bear and blame. For are not our persons and property now at the disposal of government? Is not the law omnipotent? In creating a monopoly on education, the government must answer to the hopes of the fathers of families who must who have thus been deprived of their liberty. And if, and if these hopes are shattered, whose fault is it? If regulating industry, in regulating industry, the government has contracted to make it prosper. Otherwise, it's absurd to deprive industry of its liberty. And if industry now suffers, whose fault is it? In meddling with the balance of trade by playing with tariffs, the government therefore contracts to make trade prosper. And if the results of destruction instead of prosperity, whose fault is it? In giving the maritime industries protection in exchange for their liberty, the government undertakes to make them profitable. And if they become a burden unto the taxpayers, whose fault is it? <clears throat> Thus, it is not a grievance in a nation for which government does not voluntarily make itself responsible. It is surprising, then, that every failure increases the threat of another revolution in France. And what remedy is to propose of this? To extend indefinitely the domain of the law, that is, the responsibility of government. A science of economics must be developed before a science of politics can be logically formulated. Essentially, economics is the study of determining whether the interests of a human beings are harmonious or antagonistic. This must be known before a science of politics can be formulated to determine the proper functions of government. Immediately following the development of a science of economics, and at the very beginning of the formulation of politics, this all-important question must be answered. What is law? What ought to be? What is its scope, its limits? Logically, at what point do the powers do we? At what point do the just powers of the legislator stop? I do not hesitate to answer. The law is common force organized to act as an obstacle of injustice. Law, in short, is justice. Mr. Louis Blanc would say, and with reason, that these minimum guarantees are merely the beginning of a complete fraternity. He would say that the law should give tools of production and free education to all working people. Another person who observed that this arrangement would still leave room for inequality, he would claim that the law should give 
everyone's seen in the most unaccessible hamlet luxury literature and art. All of these proposals are the high road to communism. Legislation will be, in fact, it already is, the battlefield for the fantasies and greed of everyone. Law is justice. In this proposition, a simple and enduring government can be conceived. And I defy anyone to say how the thought of revolution, of insurrection, of the slightest uprising could arise against a government whose organized force was confined only to suppressing injustice. Under such a regime, there would be the most prosperity, and it would be most equally distributed. And for the sufferings and the inseparable from humanity, no one would ever think of accusing the government for them. This is true because if the force of government were limited to suppressing injustice, the government would be as innocent of these sufferings as is now innocent of charges and the t changes in the temperature. Law is justice. It is under the law of justice, under the reign of right, under the influence of liberty, safety, stability, and responsibility, that every person will attain real worth and true dignity of his being. It is only under this law of justice that mankind will achieve slowly, no doubt, but certainly, God's design for the orderly and peaceful progress of humanity. It seems to me that this is theoretically right. For whatever the question under discussion, at whatever point on the scientific horizon I begin my researches, I invariably reach at this conclusion. The solution to the problems of human relationships is to be found in liberty. And do not ex and does not experience not prove this? Look at the world. Which countries contain the most peaceful, the most moral, the most happiest people? Those people are to be found in countries where the law least interferes with private affairs, where government is least felt, where the individual has the greatest scope and free opinion, the great of the greatest influence, where administrative powers are the fewest and simplest, where taxes are lightest and most nearly equal, and property discontent the least excited and the least justifiable. Where individuals and groups most actively assume their responsibilities, and consequently, where the morals of admittedly imperfect human beings are constantly improving, where trade, assemblies, and associations are least restricted, where labor, capital, and population suffer the fewest forced displacements, where mankind most nearly follows its own natural inclinations, where the inventions of men are nearly in harmony with the laws of God. In short, happiness, most moral, and most peaceful people are those who most nearly follow this principle. Although mankind is not perfect, still it's still all hope rests upon the free and voluntary actions of persons within the limits of law. Right of force, it is used for nothing except the administration of universal justice. God has given men all that is necessary for them to accomplish the destinies. He has provided a social form as well as a human form. And these social organs of persons are so constituted, they will develop themselves harmoniously in the clean air of liberty. Away then with quacks and organizers. Away with their rings, chains, chains, hooks. Away with their artificial systems. Away with the whims of government administrators, their socialized projects, their centralization, their tariffs, their government schools, their state religions, their free credit, their bank monopolies, their regulations, their restrictions, their equalization by taxation, and their pious moralizations. And now the legislators and do-gooders have so futilely inflicted uh, so many systems upon society that they finally end up where they should have begun. May they reject all systems and try liberty, for liberty is an acknowledgement of faith in God and his works. And this is where I end, uh, this is where the law ends, and this is where I conclude my citation of Bastia. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to ask you one quick question before we start the general questions. Yes. If one is to learn more about Bastiat, what would be the best resource for him to go to? The best resource uh, for learning about Bastiat is to go to Google and Google Bastiat. His works are free, they're in the public domain. You can find uh, all sorts of websites and lectures and whatnot. Uh, Google Bastiat. 
Okay. Is uh, is there going to be a uh, question and answer period? Andy, you want to moderate? Moderate the questions. What's the, what's the problem? Andy, you want, can you self moderate? You think? All right, we got a volunteer. All right. All right. All right. All right. Um, All right. As moderator, I'm going to ask the next question. Was Bastian influenced by Thomas Jefferson? Uh, the biography I read uh, didn't mention anything. I'm sure he was familiar with the American Revolutionaries, uh, but he was actually really, the, the, what I have read, he was more influenced by English uh, free trade uh, classical liberals. Okay. I don't know if he read the Declaration of Independence. He may have. I mean, it was it was probably, he, uh, he kind of... He kind of repeat, he kind of you know like Thomas Jefferson. He seems to have paraphrased a little bit of uh, John Locke. So, uh, okay. uh, George. Well, in, in the in the twentieth century, there's where uh, a hundred million people, over a hundred million people, murdered by socialist regime, regimes, including Russia, China. Uh, <coughs> Russia, China. Uh, yeah, all, of, all those countries. Laos, Cambodia. Cuba. Germany, Nazi Germany was actually a socialist. It was nas okay, national so your socialist. Are. The question is, why does socialism do it? 100 million people were killed. Uh, it's, it's, it, Bastiat never touches on that, but in my opinion, uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's a... Because... Uh, it, bec Mob rule, you know, like like Bernie said, you know, like there's just like steal and mass plunder and you know, like it's just uh, as Bastiat pointed out, it infects society and and it can lead to uh, ruin, even just like a little bit, like the United States had. Question, so, uh, Pat. Yeah, uh, now that uh, we've gotten past your climax here, uh, I'm wondering uh, what would you cite as uh, examples of. Uh, happy countries uh, that uh, the rest of the world should uh, emulate? Uh, I would say that countries uh, the, the world should emulate would be uh, rel countries with relatively free markets and uh, United States uh, countries in Europe. New Zealand. New Zealand, Australia, um, you know. Uh, questions? Uh, yes, Dave Zimmer, Zucker. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, was he influenced at all by Thomas Paine? I, I, I haven't read any uh, citations of Bastiat to Paine. Of Paine. Uh, I'm sure he was familiar with it. He was a he liked to study. He was he inherited uh, his estate, which allowed him to have tenant farmers, and he was able to study and. He wasn't. In, he wasn't really a businessman, even though he supported free trade and commerce. He he was more of a a intellectual. So he preferred to study. So I'd imagine. I'm going to speculate that he studied the American founders and he studied a lot of the classical liberalism up until that point. It had nothing to do with political Ellen Corley. Uh, yes, I. My hypothesis about this it has guy. To be a question. Yeah. Is um. Is that, and I you is that he, um, free market, is, I question, and maybe you, you know, I don't know if there's evidence that you Louder. can give. I think you have to look at the context people like this talk to. But in general, I have read people like Hayek and Milton Friedman and people with this libertarian economic bent, and I would question whether they are really free market. I think that's what the propaganda that I, they design are designed to say. But in fact, I think they are putting capital over democracy. And I think what's we your have question? To, so I would. I'm just questioning this. Yeah, you know. Well, I don't think. Your I think Bastiat was. Have you questioned your premises? I, I I have no evidence that Bastiat was insincere in his beliefs. I don't think he would waste his life. Uh, Writing and, and organizing he could be for a reactionary. questions. Well, I don't think he couldn't be. He was he was not a reactionary in that he he uh, was he wanted he thought the law should he wanted more of a 
He didn't want a king, so he was not a reactionary. But he, he wanted a very want, Excuse me, this not is not rebuttal. This, oh, okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Bastiat's ideas seem so based on the religious concept of. Could you quiet down, please? Rights being given by God. How does it turn into a world where, into a secular world where maybe people don't believe in human rights? Yes. Did you uh, pretend you're an atheist? Then? Yes, I, I think that Bast because Bastiat, uh, Bastiat was a religious Catholic. Um, I don't agree that that's where the origin of rights and whatever come from. But but uh, I mean he his he seems to have taken a natural rights approach and just put. Where do your natural God. rights come from if you don't believe in? God. Yeah, so I mean, they're just like in, in you know, the, the, the nature of man before governments were formed. They were free, they were, you know, able to uh, defend themselves against attack and to make use of the, the resources around them. Um, he was also against state religion, so I don't think he was in favor of, he's obviously not in favor of imposing religious uh, views on people. He thought he believed in the separation of church and state, obviously. So I, 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 I would imagine as a, as the classical liberal he was, he, even though he, he sort of had this uh, religious um, attachment to where the origin of rights come from, I think that it, you know, the, the, how they apply, how he wants to apply his principles is inclusive and tolerant and accepting and you don't have to, uh, I guess, accept that, but he tries to argue for maximum liberty and freedom amongst all people. So where do libertarians get that right from today? Repeat the question. What gives you the right? What, why do what gives you your right? If it's not God, who gives you? They just exist because uh, they just exist because we're humans. They exist. We all have a. Uh, we, you know, we all have this, uh, dignity, and our lives can't be uh, innately. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. So, um, the, the extremes of uh, any, you know, philosophy, you know, uh, can have adverse effects. You know, I'm, you know, they're throwing the political, you know, debates going on I right now. I need a question, now. please. In the, in the political debates that are going on right now, they're throwing the, the word socialism. Okay, but you can go back to the founding of this country from the Boston Common School. You have a to the period. government. Yeah, to, you know, to the, I'll, I'll get to the question, to the establishment of the internet, you know, intercontinental well, which was partly governments, you know, sponsored, to uh, land grant colleges. No. Are these examples of infringements of liberty in, in his opinion? Probably. Could you repeat that? Yes, and because you, did, did the that. land, who where did the land come from for these colleges? We conquered the Native Americans, right? Right. So there was plunder. We, we, we took plunder from one person and gave it to another person. Um, you, what else did you mention? Yeah. Or even Railroads is another example of stolen land. Okay, next question. Uh, yes. Um, do you think that uh, Basikot would have come to the same conclusions about life if he hadn't been in a merchant family and inherited great wealth from his uncle? Um, I'm sure him having the life that he led and had afforded him the opportunity to go to a school that had these ideas taught to him. Um, he, uh, I mean, I, 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 he, there's a lot of people who, who thought like he did because he, he tried to organize people who felt the same way he did. Um, so, uh, <laughs> he was not, you know, he was a, um, I don't know, I, I, I think it's, it's, I don't know really, I mean he was, he, he came from a tradition in France where the king, the divine right of kings, right? So that the king uh, had the rights to uh, rule the country as he wanted to, 
As a Catholic, he didn't believe in that. So I think that uh, even as, uh, you know. All right, question, sir. In the introduction, well, of your, speech, the introduction of your speech, it was said that Bastia believed that, that all table. socialism is communism. We're going to sorry. talk about that. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, you could take it up with him. Mention, him. But uh, in case you mentioned, what, what, what was that again? Why does socialism always lead to communism? Just that it, uh, just that you you keep at giving. Thank you so much. Keep asking the government for to do this and that, and it takes on so much responsibility that. It's just an it's an oppressive sort of system. Mm -hmm. Questions? He called uh, he called he called socialism communism basically like you know. Sir in the back. Was there any connection with the revolution of eighteen forty eight in France and the ones around the similar time in Russia? Was there a connection between the revolution in France and the one in Prussia? I'm not familiar with the how the the history of the other revolutions in France. I do know. <laughs> that the 48 revolution did spark a lot of other revolutions around Europe. I think this is where uh, Marx wrote uh, the Communist Manifesto, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, and I, I, but I, I don't know the causes of those or what, how those came to be, so. That's a fair answer. Okay, yes, Chuck? <laughs> I said several times that Bastiat's ideology is rooted in, in Catholic, Catholicism. On Christianity, Jesus shared the food when they had the loaves and the fishes. They said, well, everyone in the community will share in this food. He didn't say, oh, there's the law of property. It's the antithesis of uh, Jesus said to keep the commandments. Jesus One of those commandments is thou shalt not steal. So I don't recall Jesus uh, using a gun to beat uh, people into feeding the poor. Uh, Andy Anderson. <laughs> what you know, if his philosophy was adopted by our government today, 19, you know, 2019, what are the first three things he would do to change what's going on in America? What what government changes would he make? First three things, the top three. What he I would say he would open up trade with everybody. He'd he'd uh, he would you know he would reverse all the the Trump sort of trade war stuff and make it even more free than it was before Trump. I think he would try to uh, scale back and on on as many government programs uh, as he could because a lot of pro you know, programs are funded by heavy taxation. So I think he would probably, uh, not only like he, he mentioned, uh, he mentioned tariffs, he also mentioned uh, he'd probably abolish the minimum wage. He'd probably abolish, uh, um, so, so your top three are? I guess, I guess he would tariffs, uh, Price floors and price ceilings. I'm sorry. Well, if you uh, if you throw pollution into the air, you're stealing the clean air. So that's a form of plunder. So I think that uh, Bastiat would have a problem with. As a Catholic who probably believed that man should be good stewards of the environment, I think Bastiat would not be fine with. Are there any more first-time questions? Who has not asked a question and has one? Does, did Ellen just have a Oh, I had to call. But did you already ask one? He before? did. Ellen, did you have a question? Uh, no, not right now. Okay, so so there are no more first-time questions. I've got one question. Yes, sir. Um, last year I talked about... Uh, Louder, the, please. Uh, the law and uh, proper use of the law is uh, self-defense. So uh, for individuals, I imagine it extended to groups. So I would assume that he would be for uh, unions and uh, yeah. labor, labor organizing. Of course, uh, in the uh, in, in part of my speech, he, he said that he does not want to impose on people to make to form associations or to get in, into. I think the phrase he said was social combinations. His only problem was is if you try to use the law. To, he's not. He probably would not be uh, against labor unions. He'd probably be against labor unions 
pushing for minimum wage or for public pensions or something like that. Okay. Okay. Questions. Round two. Uh, All right. Uh, if you don't mind, what do you think? What was Bastiat? Did do you think Bastiat was uh, had any of his work? Do you think he was influenced by De Tocqueville? The guy he, he was a contemporary of De Tocqueville. So they were, uh, Tocqueville and him were in the National Assembly at the same time. It's unclear to me if they knew each other um, or if they were acquainted with each other. The biography I read quotes a lot of uh, Tocqueville because he was present to watch a lot of the events that, that Bastia was witnessing, witnessing himself. Uh, but they were contemporaries. Okay. I think he I think he was a little bit younger and he lived a little bit longer than, than Bastia. Back Butler. Yeah. Uh, if I understand you right, uh, you and uh, Bastia are uh, against uh, publicly funded schools, public schools? Yes. Bastia specifically pointed it out multiple times throughout the work that he was against then would provide the education. <laughs> he uh, he uh, had he uh, he had people send him to school. He he went to a Catholic school. Not everyone. So church. You know what it costs to send a kid to Catholic school today? High school costs oh, like right. six thousand dollars. I also read something uh, that that that. Uh, the cost of a student in public schools is more than the cost of an individual student in a private school. So, uh, so I mean, it, uh, uh, Ellen. Okay. So if um, if you don't believe in the funding of the public schools, then wouldn't you have to say that there should be no law that uh, parents are required to provide their children with an education or a schooling? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I honestly did not like going to school. I was forced to go there, or else my parents would have been thrown in jail for truancy. Right, because right. my, my co-worker, she, she's like, if I don't send my kids to school, I'll go to jail. Sir? Yeah, that's the law's fault. Stat. The law, yes. Uh, objecting to you, the law. you said that, uh, that Basquiat based his ideas on life, liberty, and property. Right. Yes. Why not life, liberty, property, and health care? <laughs> I would imagine that uh, he would, if, if, I'm sure he believed that, yeah, sure you have a right to go see a doctor, you, you don't have the right to go see that doctor and it be covered by the taxpayers. Why should the taxpayers want to protect your property? That is a, uh, that is a interesting point that Bastiat does not actually address. Uh, there, there is this contradiction, and uh, you know we, we need a defensive force, but we. So yeah, I mean, there's it's kind of a paradox, for sure. All right. Yes, over oh, it's a blue hair. Oh, um, I wonder if you mind comparing the people who were murdered by their socialist governments, the numbers of people who were killed by their socialist governments, and the number of people who have been killed in capitalistic wars. <laughs> Okay, uh, which which capitalistic war are you referring to? Vietnam. Yeah, one, World War One, World War Two. Uh, somebody named Vietnam, 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 so let me make sure I understand this. He also would have been against paying police and fire departments to protect us from... No, he felt that that was a proper function of the law. <coughs> okay. Because, because those people, because they protect property and they protect your life, because you can do that individually, it's okay for us to have those institutions. Ellen Corley. Yes. Um, and a question. Right. I'm going to formulate a question. I'm... A, could you speak to this concern philosophically that there's liberty and achievement versus social conscience, right? And we need a combination. I think that deregulation, total deregulation of the libertarian tends to, um, it depends <laughs> in, on the context. And so I think if you put it in context of back then, Okay. You know, like you could deregulate the utilities, but if you think about it, the time, 
government utilities are needed because so all the people get the energy, it's right? It, and how do we how do we have um, water, electricity? Uh, yeah. How do you have water, electricity, and um, television? And um, yeah, certain common public interest things have to be regulated. How do you have streets? Otherwise, okay. Question answer. Question answer. Uh, he is not. Uh, he does not, like, as I mentioned uh, uh, with this gentleman's question about health care, he does not address a uh, means of um, even providing for, for these services uh, that are essential. Now, he didn't actually, he didn't live in the time of uh, mass communications and, and whatnot. I don't know what he thought about roads, um, but I imagine that... Uh, authoritarian king all right George mm -hmm. Marx in the Communist Manifesto he appealed to cl cl class uh, class solidarity rather than national solidarity where would uh, Bastiat be on this I don't think Bastiat was much of a nationalist because uh, he was from uh, he's from the south he was in from Bayonne which is in the southwest of France which is just across the border from uh, Spain so the Basque people, the people that, that share common traditions and way of life, are on both sides of that border. So I don't believe that not Bastiat was a nationalist. He was for. He said that uh, if if goods don't cross borders, armies will. If you'll let me clarify, was Bastiat himself a Basque? I I. I'm unclear on that, but he that's where he's from, and I imagine that even if he wasn't Basque, he still had that. Uh, that uh, he he had that sort of uh, mentality. He does also talk about, uh, in, I guess, in uh, because of the border uh, against uh, Switzerland, a Frenchman couldn't go to this close, the closest like trading posts. He had to go to the one within the borders. Yeah, so he, he didn't. He wasn't a fan of borders. He felt that you should be able to cross borders as easily as possible. Charlie Paydock, you have a question. Yeah, in any philosophical discussion of the law is an inherent question of what is justice. And it doesn't seem to me like this gentleman, his, his idea of the law is to preserve social stratification. Yet people are not, are not obligated, the law does not obligate or in effect an equitable sharing let me finish, please. The law does not allow for an equitable sharing of the goods and services that the society produces? Um, no, because that includes taking from one and giving to another. That's not just. That's not no, it's not just. Basia, uh, no. Why not? Because <coughs> you're stealing from somebody. That's why it's not. We have a final question there. Okay, what did Bastia think of uh, economic monopolies where a few companies dominate an industry? Well, what he was against that. As, as I mentioned, as I, as I, <laughs> pardon me, my throat. As I had uh, quoted him a few times, he was against monopoly. He believed that monopoly existed because the government gave favors to industry and protected them and gave them that monopoly power. But isn't that also a consequence of uh, the lack of enforcement of the Sherman antitrust system? Uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, I mean maybe I don't know what antitrust laws existed in early, mid 1800s in France. <laughs> Uh, but I can just tell you that he was against monopolies. Uh, we're ready for our rebuttal session. Um, Raise your hands up and see how many were having rebuttals. <laughs> can you do a count, please? One, two, three, four, five. Hands up, please. These libertarians do a rebuttal. Uh, Eleven. Okay. Go Twelve. about. Go about uh, three to. We'll go four minutes. Don't use up all the time. Uh, let's get up there and get speaking well. Thank Karina for moderating tonight. Thank you. All right, wait a minute. Uh, although I'm not a capitalist, I forgot to announce next week's program. Uh, Margaret Goldstein will be returning. She's the author of two books. Uh, as a matter of fact, somewhat related to the topic tonight. 
She wrote one called The Selfishness System. Uh, but she's going to be talking uh, uh, regarding uh, social uh, social change uh, and the, the status quo. Uh, why are we locked into the status quo? All right, thank you very much. All right. Okay, four minutes. Uh, after, after this talk about law, I could not resist telling you about a, another book, and it's written by Elaine Scarry. We all know her brother Joe. Jill Scarry. Jill Scarry. It's his, his sister wrote it, and uh, the name of the book is. Uh, I know the name of this book. Mononuclear. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, what do you call the H bomb? The hydrogen bomb. Thermonuclear. Oh, thermonuclear. Uh, thermonuclear monopoly. No, that's not even the right name. Thermonuclear. Um, What's the author's name? Scarry. Uh, the name of the author is Elaine Scarry. Scarry. S C A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anyway, it, what the title means is that the, the what the title means is that the bomb is the ruler of us all. Yes. And this book, uh, Thermonuclear Monopoly. Anyway, the, this book by Elaine Scarry is a meditation on the Second Amendment, which the speaker tonight was very big on the Second Amendment. I feel because he says law is the thing that really allows us to defend ourselves no. and uh, that that we, we uh, and so she uh, points out in this book that when the existence of the bomb prevents us from uh, implementing the second amendment because we no longer have control over our self-defense and we are not able to decide when or who to, who to defend ourselves from, or able to defend ourselves from someone who wants to harm us. And I return the rest of my time to Margaret. I don't have to tell Yes. I don't want to miss your comment, Margaret. Please come now. All right, Margaret. I'm sorry that I'm shoving in front of people, but anyway, I will be short. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is that um, the countries that are the happiest on the international polls are socialist countries yeah. in Scandinavia. Yeah. And they pay a, a lot of tax, and they have free education through the college level. They have health care that's universal and is paid for by the state. They have minimum, uh, minimum income things. They don't have a high poverty level. And the, and the people are actually pretty happy, and in fact, in Finland, the women, thank you, uh, those daughters, because all of them are daughters, um, and the, is their name, were, was the only country that threw bankers in jail for, for dumping the economy. So th that's the first thing. And the second thing is that, in my opinion, public education is a sacred responsibility of a democracy to provide education for its citizens, for the children so they will be able to make informed decisions, to be able to co uh, to work together to make a real democracy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 What about Venezuela? Oh, no, no, no. no. The happiest countries in the world do include socialist countries, but the happiest countries among those socialist countries are the ones with the most free markets, free trade, and free speech. So you have to have a high degree of both worker protection and the right to start small business if you want to have a happy country. And uh, yes, um, public education is propaganda. But I agree with uh, most of what Basia said that you know legal plunder is how the state gets its money, and that uh, state uses us as tools, and the law is force. Um, whether it's for protectionism for the benefit of the nation and capitalist interests, or whether it's for the left 
Um, but I disagree with the idea that socialism always becomes communism because we know communism is big C, Soviet Union, international communism. But there were anarcho-communists too who just wanted small territories because uh, it's all they could cling on to with like, you know, Western liberal democracy, fascists carrying on them at all sides. That's what happened in the Paris Commune. And uh, some important people to know about if you want to study Basiat are two people he had contact with in his life. One is his intellectual heir, Gustav de Molinari, after whom the Libertarian Molinari Institute is named in Alabama. He was one of the first people to suggest maybe we can do everything without the state, even our own defense and justice. And of course, he criticized the Paris Commune as kind of be, becoming too monopolistic, but that was hard to avoid becoming monopolistic because they had the French and the Prussian armies to fight off at the same time. It's hard not to join up into one, you know, they're trying to occupy a city and prevent, you know, the French army from occupying them. Um, and Justin was right to, you know, point out how Basiat said, um, you know, people say about libertarians, capitalists, if we object to the state doing it, it's almost as if they think we object to it being done at all. Like, just because we object to taking someone's tax money and, and giving it to farmers doesn't mean we are against food or planting grain. But uh, in the spirit of that, I hope Justin understands that free, um, free markets are supposed to produce free credit. Government is not the only way to get free credit. If we have free markets, then we have competition to provide lower interest loans. And people will always choose those lower interest loans. And that's why people will choose zero credit loans so they can get them. We don't need the state to force them to do that. They want to do that through the market. The state is arguably making that difficult. Okay. Next, please. Thermonuclear Monarchy is the name of that book I was trying to. <laughs> okay, next, four minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, good evening. A long, long time ago, a man named Joseph told the Pharaoh there was going to be seven years of prosperity and seven years of drought. When the drought came on, the uh, people of Egypt went to the pharaoh asking for supplies because they didn't have any. Once their money was used up, and every, can I have some attention here, please? Once their money and everything was used up, the pharaoh gave them the supplies they needed. When the drought was finally over, the Pharaoh owned everything. All the land. All, he owned, hello? He owned all the land, he owned all the cattle, he owned everything. And so then after that, everyone worked for the Pharaoh. Now that is an example of socialism. And it didn't work because the time came when they enslaved the Hebrews and then the Hebrews finally had to leave and Egypt at that point was basically done. So socialism didn't work from a long, long time ago and it hasn't worked any time in between and it doesn't work now and that's all I have to say. <laughs> All right, four minutes. The word socialism has been used as an epithet against uh, progressive uh, activists. From the forming of Boston Common Schools to the development of the internet. Into, you know, you use the mic, please. Continental, you know, uh, railway to uh, to common to common, you know, uh, to land grant colleges. There has right. always there has always been a degree of government intervention in the economy. Fast forward to the the Great Depression and. The great, you know, pejoratives against that. What people seem to forget is that seven million people voted for Nor Norman Thomas, including an economics professor who later became senator of you know, of Illinois. 
Senator Douglas. So there's a, there has always been inter intervention, and I think our society is better because of it. When you have a society in which large amounts of people do not have a stake in that society, that, that, it, that is a dangerous, dangerous situation. So the government doesn't have a right to, to really impose, uh, to protect the rights of women, of minorities, of people of, of sexual orientation. You have a credit card? I think they have a role yeah. to play in, in those you common can. areas. But you gain. And the whole idea that you're going to have this libertarian dream from, a, from, from, from an individual who, who, who uh, was smart enough to choose his own parents. Good for him. But that's not everyone's experience. So it may have some limited utility for a lot of people, but it doesn't apply for everyone. Okay. Next. I, Can I go real fast? Sure, go ahead. All right, Heather. <coughs> I'm sorry, but does anybody have a credit card slip that's signed I did not collect yet? No? Okay, thank you, sir. Give Heather a hand again. <laughs> and girl, Heather. Thanks a lot. I wish that our speaker had been, uh, as he read his talk tonight, had been a little more uh, clear on exactly what type of system he is talking about. He said relatively little about government, and I kind of winced when he called public education uh, a form of thievery. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. And uh, who then is going to take care of the education of children who can't afford to send their kids to Francis Parker <laughs> and can't afford to send their kids to the local parochial school or the local parochial high school. The days uh, when uh, kids would pay a dollar tuition a month to go to the local parochial school, that's gone. Today, not everyone can afford to send their kids to uh, any, uh, you know, the non-public schools. So I would think that we're all intelligent enough to realize there are certain jobs that the state needs to take over and take care of, whether we like it or not. Certainly law enforcement, certainly defense from outside uh, enemies and uh, domestic enemies. Certainly that. Certainly health care. I wish a little more had been said about how in this utopian uh, wet dream that we're talking about here, uh, I wish that we had heard how health care is going to be handled. Uh, our president hasn't got the idea yet. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if, oh, Social Security. I, I, I suppose, you know, he said nothing really about uh, what, uh, what happens with uh, Social Security recipients. Do they starve in the streets? Uh, you know, many of them are intelligent enough. They know how to make bombs. Uh, you know, you could have a new kind of trouble on your hands. Government has, like it or not, government has a responsibility to do, as Thomas Jefferson himself once said, and as several other presidents have said down through the years, to do for the people what the people, for one reason or another, cannot do for themselves. That's part of the job of government. Now, for those who can't swallow that, then maybe they need to know the things that have taken place in the last 200, 300 years, which give government uh, larger obligations than they may have had 2,000 years ago. And even 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire, in its better days, the Roman Empire provided uh, food, bread, uh, to the people who could least afford it. That was what kept the emperors in power, yes, 
but a lot of people didn't starve to death because they were take, being taken care of by the Caesars. Those of you who saw the TV series The Borgias know that as people were starving in uh, medieval Rome, Renaissance Rome, one of the popes called in his cardinals and says, why are you sitting around here doing nothing? There are people outside starving. Do something about it. And they did because you had a very, very strong personality who was running things. We need to, you know, we're, we're in a real transition period here. Regardless of how we feel about the per, present uh, incumbent in the White House, we're not, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not going to be quite the same country, quite the same government afterwards. Now is the time to determine what kind of country we are going to be. Other places are going to be watching. A lot of damage has been done, intentionally or otherwise. Repairs have got to be made, and those repairs also uh, mean that there's going to be impact on other countries. We have one chance, probably, to get it right. And I really wish that uh, the libertarians in particular would be a little bit more clear on exactly what they have in mind, because I right now am in a fog, and I've just gotten a sign, and uh, so thank you. All right. Hey, boy. Hey. 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 It's high. Up the my, name, my name's Ellen Corley. I, huh? Nothing. Ellen nothing. Corley, and I thank you for your talk. Uh, it was interesting and well done. I love free speech. Um, I think this forum's important. My argument is that I, like you, I was raised by a libertarian stepfather. He managed Ayn Rand's books, was friends with Milton Friedman. So he told me, I was every question I came up with was answered by this kind of logic. And I never, I never really, I said, okay, I'm a Republican, I'm a libertarian because I can't win an argument with you. And it just shows that if you take it out of context, you can logically, I think this is logical positivism or something. You can logically make this argument and never lose it. Uh, you, it will hold up and maybe in court, depending on how the law is written. What I have found, though, that disproves it, I, was, I had a job at People's Energy to evaluate whether we should deregulate. And I'm like, I, don't, I couldn't find anybody. Like, why not? You know, nobody cared. Well, look at what was... What? Why did they regulate? Probably some socialists or some communists or some activists or unionists. You know, people. There was a problem, and big business, government, maybe military, armies. You know, needed to be regulated. We. They, it's the state. I recently saw the definition of collusion in this wonderful documentary about these Miami band that was bombed in Ireland where the same there's a wall you know the Protestants versus the Catholics they got bombed because the MI6 was paying the police there was collusion between the state the police and the military just as there is now I've given talks on the deep state they this I agree they need to be stopped you know, I, I think, but unfortunately, Milton Friedman and the Libertarians and probably Batiste um, is my hypothesis, they, they ascribe to law and the government, you know, as the sins of the authoritarian military, Catholic Church. If you go back and look at history, the Catholic Church, it was... You know, Henry VIII versus, it's like they were warring. They were authoritarian. People thought France was great because it was authoritarian and it's easier than this confusing Magna Carta, a bunch of parliamentarians trying to balance power. The main thing, the nation state started 
and it progressed over the years so that eventually we have the Magna Carta, we have a, a representative Your time government. Is up. Okay, that's what is needed. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, thank you, Justin, for your presentation. Uh, a lot to cover from the it's scattered all over, but I think we'd be a little unfair to expect um, anachronistically the Bastiat essay to have anticipated all the questions of today. If to some extent my friend was giving a presentation on a piece from the 1850s that you know didn't say much about uh, air travel. Sorry, Andy. Uh, but th that's something worth remembering, you know, that uh, you, you can insert your later questions for us to argue about as people here, but you can't fault Bastiat too much for not anticipating. What was medical care like in 1850, Mr. Butler? Come on. You wouldn't, in 30 years after Bastiat's death, James Garfield got terrible health care that, that killed him. So we after he was getting the finest as president of the United States because they put their fingers in the bullet wound and he died of sepsis. So you're putting the cart before the horse on some of that. Uh, but in terms of some of the other examples, we know he was anti-war, uh, and in his own day, the French colonization of Algeria had begun, and he was a strenuous opponent of that. That had begun in the early 1830s, I believe, and he fought that throughout his whole career. And when it came to unions, even though he was a free marketeer, he went into the streets to uh, help rescue people during the uh, summer of 1848 when the first wave of the 1848 revolution uh, ended with a showdown between uh, the left-wing socialist activists and the counter-revolutionary military. And many people were surprised that even though he was a critic of the economic policies of the unions, uh, he was adamant in his defense of their right to organize and to not be crushed by the military and not murdered in the street. And he was quite consistent in that throughout his career. And he was a lonely figure because the whole time up to the 1848 revolution, he'd been opposing the protectionists. Hold a second. There are people here who have the right to have their own conversation right. in their own time. But we are yeah. trying to listen to you, but we have to listen to their shit. Yeah. Right, right. One fool at a time, if they'll allow me. That's good enough. Let's go. Uh, uh, sorry for the interruption there, but uh, much appreciated, Frank, thank you. Um, lost my train of thought a little bit, but uh, I know we have a lot of people who piled up, so I won't hold us on for too long. But yes, he had defended unions as a matter of free association, and he didn't like the rule of the military in the streets, and he did not like, yeah, the old protectionist elite. He spent the first part of his career uh, fighting against that, and if the assumption is that you can always go to the state to get them to do things on your behalf, well, then the big businesses are going to outmaneuver the ordinary people most of the time. Or they'll find a way to get, well, oh, just, just enough for the wine growers in my region, or just enough of a tariff on iron imports because we're too near the Belgian border in a different region. Uh, or something like that. That, they do that? They'll, oh, they did that all the time. That was the, that was the way. That's why it was the lonely voice of free trade against a mostly protectionist France uh, in his era. They passed a free trade treaty 13 years after his death, I believe, with uh, one of the ministers that he used to argue against, Chevalier, negotiated with Cobden and Bright, finally a free trade treaty in the 1860s between France and Britain. Uh, and it took a while even for Cobden and Bright to get the uh, Corn Laws repealed in Britain until, unfortunately, the Irish famine had already begun. Anyway, I've probably gone around the circles a little bit, but uh, I thought this was a very interesting subject, and I think Basia has a lot of other interesting ideas, even if, no, he doesn't answer every question uh, in anticipation of modern social democracy. But if we are seeing now that it's also possible for people to demand public benefits for themselves, uh, even socialistic sounding benefits for themselves in, a, in a, you know, what we would think of as an attractive way, like schools or healthcare or something, but then say, yeah, but then not for you know, other people living here. And we see an alt-right party growing in Sweden. We had Richard Spencer, who was an advocate of universal healthcare as well as white nationalism. This is capable of being part of the discourse as well. Uh, collectivism has its good and bad sides, and we're seeing that catch up with us. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, next. Thank you, Justin. 
Uh, my understanding of the difference between totalitarian communism and democratic socialism is rooted in the combination of several things. I grew up for three years in my youth in Northern Europe. Uh, author, professor, activist Noam Chomsky is one of my favorite speakers, authors, thinkers. I've learned a lot from attending grassroots organizing campaigns and movements. I've read a lot of non-corporate non uh, newspapers, pamphlets, zines, journals, magazines, especially in these times, the Progressive, Labor Notes, Jacobin, Z Magazine, and listen to a lot of radio and television shows like This Is Hell with Chuck Mertz and Democracy Now. And uh, I've learned a lot from working in Illinois over the last 27 years, providing independent living services to the disability community and members of the chronic injury community. I always remind anyone uh, who is interested in either system, principles, solution to the uh, problems we face that the greatest omission many analysis of the ideas developed by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels is that Marx was not only a writer, thinker, historian, philosopher of extraordinary vision and skill, he's a member of the disability community. Marx remembered for his advocacy for the global liberation of oppressed peoples, workers, struggling to overcome a tyranny of greed, which is rewarded by a system of lies that is managed by a cartel of fools, must be put in the correct context. As one who had to fight to survive every day in a world that was cruel to anyone perceived as being the other. At a time when disability rights and independent living were virtually non-existent, if not for a few gracious souls like Engels. Otherwise, these concepts appear extreme and unreasonable to those who have always known comfort and high quality of life. Marx and Engels lived during an era when those who dared to question authority and declare their autonomy were routinely opposed with vicious acts of violence by those in positions of wealth, power, and influence Sadly, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Marx was in terrible pain when he was sitting, standing, walking on level surface, walking uphill or upstairs, or while carrying heavy weight, and faced all of the hurdles one has while living with a disability in an unaccessible environment. The status quo minded people of that time rejected him as well as his ideas in a way we cannot easily conceive. For some it's still radical today to even suggest systematic reform, to demand both justice on earth and cooperation on each of our blocks to achieve peace combined with mass participation is not yet within many people's capacity for change and so to demand systematic change also almost seems like reaching for the stars. Back then it was even more difficult to get new ideas to be considered, and yet people were willing to do whatever it took to get it published. That's what makes Marx important. He's battling multiple challenges simultaneously during which he is either ignored, mocked, excluded, decried, censored, vilified, and assaulted by members of the mainstream. He's an iconoclastic human being who does not back down from nor give up the good fight at a time when many others who had far more advantages yield under far less pressure. And that's why democratic socialism is so important. It's born in sacrifice. It's born in service, in solidarity, in work, in perseverance, in bridge building, and in love. You can call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. In May of 65, one of our greatest truth tellers, Martin Luther King Jr., had that quote, which is often not told in the mainstream media. Thank you, Justin, for a great talk and outstanding enlightenment into the libertarian movement, which continue to feel very good about how you make me stronger and hopefully I make you stronger. Yes. You're my brother. Okay. I respect your Time. whatever makes you free. That's beautiful. Next. Who's up next? Okay. 
I just want to address the comment, the comment that was made earlier about Nazis being socialists. They weren't. They used the word socialist and the color red to make people believe they were. Hitler vowed the destruction of Marxism the year he took power. He was not a socialist. It was a, it was a ruse. Also, um, another person I forgot to tell you about besides Molinari that's important in Basiat's life was Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who served um, with Basiat in the National Assembly at the same time. He was a mutualist and an anarchist. So as a mutualist, he's between capitalism and socialism. And he and Basiat, I guess, argued a bit about credit, which kind of explains <coughs> some of the uh, conversation between me and Justin tonight. Justin's kind of the Basiat to Mike Proudhon. And uh, I, I, I'm glad that Justin uh, acknowledged that taxing people to pay for private property protection is just as unjust as taxing people to pay for helping the poor. But I also want to note that the only reason you have to tax people to help the poor in the first place is because government's trying to make up for something it did wrong that resulted in those poor people being deprived of their property or their opportunity to compete in the first place. Thank you. All right. Let uh, David Zucker go next. With regard to the comments that were made about Venezuela, much as I hate to agree with the Trump administration about anything, I agree with him to this extent, that the guy who's running Venezuela now is a swine. And, I, and, I, and he's a dictator and a son of a bitch. But having said that, unless he goes after American citizens, which he does not now appear to be doing, it's not our job to send troops down to Venezuela and take them out. Yeah, isolationism. If we do that, that would, if we do that, that would suddenly inflame every nation in Latin America against us. There's no reason to do that unless, as I said, it starts hassling American citizens, which he is not now doing. Uh, with regard to the comment that was, the libertarian comment that was made earlier about, gee, we could even see to our own, our own uh, law and defense. Well, some years ago when Barney Miller was still on the air, there was an episode of it in which Barney Miller and his officers had to deal with the following. A neighborhood group had gotten a, a, some kind of neighborhood grant from the Justice Department that they, that they extended far beyond what the Justice Department had in mind, to the point where they were having their own criminal trials and were actually operating their own jail for the people they convicted in those trials. And Barney and his officers had to put a stop to that. And some I have the sneaky feeling that if we started looking for our own law and justice, well, we would start seeing the same thing. Thank you. Go ahead, Andy. You're next, Jerry. Go ahead. Well, I just, all right. All right. Let's uh, thank our speaker. That was really good. There. I wanted to say I like your idea. We only get involved in foreign affairs in countries unless it affects American citizens. We don't care what happens to anybody else in the world, right? You know, as long as it's just American citizens, right? We we don't care what happens to anybody except us. That's our foreign policy. All right, I guess. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, Janet said she found the pair of glasses here. And uh, if anybody is missing one, please let me know. I'll probably turn them into the front office. But let's see, where, where should we begin? I, I ran into a libertarian friend of mine the other day, and uh, we were having a, a beer, and the, you know, I said, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of intelligent young people can't afford to go to college these days. It's very expensive. And if they do go, you know, they have crippling, crippling expenses, tuitions to pay. And he said, yeah, but we've got to adhere to the law, the Bastiat law. You know, and I said, oh, okay, well. And I said, you know, a lot of people are complaining, you know, they've been earning like less than $10, $7, $8, less than minimum wage, you know. It should be about like $33, you know. So, you know, they should raise the minimum wage because no, I said they're earning what they should, you know, it's all it's according to Bosch yet in the law. <laughs> you know, and then I said, Well, you know, uh, a lot of people don't have any health care, you know, they're they're going without the doctor's care or not going to the doctors for checkups or getting the medicine that they need. He said, No, we have, we've got to adhere to, to the law. You know, the the Bastiat law. 
you know, I, I said, well, you know, this, there's a lot of homeless people in any place to live, you know. And they said, well, we can't, that's true, but we've got to adhere to the law, the Bastion Law. No, if that's the Bastion Law, if that's a society that Bastion is offering, it, thank you. Law is not simply, this is reducing a lot of absurdum to say that the law is simply to protect the rights of property because those who have property want to retain it. And to say that's the only function of law is, is, is ridiculous. Uh, I'm going to give a talk here on how the government used the law to create a railroad across the nation. It was an enormous infrastructure project. It created jobs for people, opened up the nation to settlement, changed it in so many ways, yet this would not have been undertaken had Bastian Law been in effect at the time in the United States. So you're supporting the Credit Mobilier? No. Uh, what? You're supporting the Credit Mobilier then, right? Credit Mobilier? No, why would I do that? They were the, they were the guys who got It's the, the opposite. That was the, the matter of fact, you ought to come. What he's talking about is they left a certain portion of the financial administration of the project to the private sector, and it resulted in fraud. The part that was under government functioning operated perfectly. Uh, yeah, no, you're, that's great. You, you, a, you gave an example against your own argument. <laughs> the greatest fraud of the private sector, Wall Street, and tycoons, is not an endorsement of the private economy. There were several congressmen in How could it too. be the greatest fraud in the, the history of the United what? States does not mean the capitalist is, is argues against it, not for it. It's an example that you, you should never have infrastructure projects that allow any private sector influence. That's the one lesson to be learned by that. If you're going to undertake matter of fact, what they should have done was, in this project, was they had let private sector do the railroad building. What the government should have done was set up a railroad agency and built it as an agency of the government. Then you wouldn't have had that fraud. As it ended up, because they let the private sector operate the, the, the infrastructure project, it ended up costing twice as much as it should have, and they got one half of the railroad that they should have. It's a classic example of the failure of the private sector. Come here on May 4th, and you're going to learn companies a lot did a more good job. about it. Thank you very much. Hey, that was good, though. But I learned a lot about the law. You know, they even know, don't you know that was a private sector fraud? Uh, with, several, with several congressmen involved too, Charlie. One. One. More than one, Charlie. <laughs> one More than just one, Charlie. Oops. Somebody's got to get under the bus. <laughs> well, I thank our speaker for giving us a thought-provoking presentation. Um, a couple of observations need to be made. From any political party, um, a 16-year-old girl, as commented last fall, and has yeah. been giving speeches, was nominated for a Nobel Prize for her work. And an army of students have followed her worldwide, and the army is growing. It's up to almost 2 million students now. And Greta Thunberg said, right to the group of prime ministers over in uh, Europe, she said, hey, hey, Tim, is, is the speaker on back there? Or yes, it is. Mic? It's on. It's on? Okay. okay. But she said, the rules that we play by, the economic rules set down by countries, have failed us. Our political leaders of all stripes have totally failed us. And we are at a point now where playing by the rules is not going to solve the problem. The rules have to be changed. And she said to all politicians, change is coming whether you like it or not. And uh, the libertarian philosophy of letting the free market do it 
is a prescription for total planetary disaster, for one thing. Another thing, uh, many people are ignoring uh, the climate report that came out in the fall last year. Uh, a coalition of scientists from all over the planet said, we have 12 years left to get off fossil fuel. We have to get at least 50 to 70 percent off by 2030 at the latest, or the children here now, little kids, have no, no future beyond about 2050. Things are going to get really ugly really fast after 2035 to 2040 unless we have a, a global mobilization, a World War II type, where we don't build billions of tons worth of bonds and planes and trucks and submarines, we build billions of tons worth of solar, wind power, green everything, appliances, electric cars. Volvo is going all electric next year, for those of you that didn't know it. China is cranking out electric cars. China and Germany are cranking out affordable solar panels by the billions. There's a green revolution going on all over the world, but the new so-called New Green Deal and the people that support it, especially the children calling for climate change, there's been a virtual non-coverage total news blackout in America on this because, as one person said, it's okay to shoot adult protesters like the Israelis are doing over the fence with the Palestinians, but it's going to look bad if we start shooting 11, 12, and 13-year-old girls because they're protesting that they have no future. This army of kids is getting bigger. It's unprecedented. We've never seen anything like it. And it's there's a website you can log on to called Fridays for the Future. It's a global movement of schools. They take kids take off on Friday and go protest at their local politician's office. In uh, 125 countries are involved now. And, and more are joining all the time. So if you uh, if you don't have time to read a lot of material, you can watch a two or three or a five minute speech of Greta Thunberg, the Swedish girl, talking to uh, UN officials and politicians. Uh, she had a meeting at, with those rich people in Davos in Switzerland. And she told them right to their face, a whole bunch of billionaires have been making obscene profits by destroying the environment. And I think some of those billionaires may be among those of you that are here today. Right to their face. You guys have been screwing up the planet, and we as kids have no future if, if it doesn't change. So she said, we call on all of you, join us if you will, the adults. But if you won't, we will we will solve the problem ourselves, and we want you to know change is coming whether you like it or not. So that, I will be giving a speech on this, what the Green New Deal is, who profits from it, who benefits, who supports it, what it is, what's in it, and how to pay for it. June, June 29th. Time. So come and uh, see it then. Thank you. I would definitely, definitely agree with what the previous speaker you know, said. Okay. The same clowns that pushed the Bush tax cuts resulted in the biggest recession since the Great Depression. So why in the world are we even listening to these fools? Just look, at, just look back to when Obama was elected. And by the time he was inaugurated, 700,000 jobs per month were, were being clipped from the economy. What will it take to get out of this libertarian bullshit? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what, you know, and the deregulation. It did not do anything. It made, it made things worse. I saw my own retirement savings cut in half because of, you know, conservative, you know, um, you know, economic policies. You know, it's time to say enough is enough and begin looking at things that actually work. Countries like China, who, who can't seem to graduate enough engineers per clip. And what do we do in this country? We cut back on student aid instead of investing, you know, in young people. 
I listened last week to Governor Insler from the, the state of you know Washington, where jobs generated by wind, solar exceed the you know the num number of jobs that that uh, are produced by fossil fuels. It's time to get off that kick and, 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 and score in a new direction. I, you know, I, I, I am just in awe of these kids who have gone to court and, and uh, the, you know, we're not talking about liberal courts at this point. They won every appeal along the way. So it's time to change courses. All right. Next. Uh, hello, hi. My name is Ellen. I have just a couple of quick comments. Um, yeah, I think there's there's an inherent inherent conflict. Um, you know, we have to have people who are willing to be productive, who are willing to work. Um, and yet, you know, we also have to care for the poor and the vulnerable. Um, however, you know, I, I think both of those things have, have their limitations. I mean, um, you know, people should be encouraged to work and be productive. Um, and if you, like, I, I'm currently, like, I'm opposed to a guaranteed minimum income. Um, because I, I think that's gonna, that's definitely going to in, discourage people from working. I mean, there's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people work for you know they, they're working for the money. I mean, they're they're not working just because they enjoy it. Um, and and if, if, if you take away that incentive, they're they're not going to be willing to work um, or not be willing to work very much. Right now, people are really motivated to work because. They know they're going to be in trouble if they don't. Um, it, it's also societal expectation, which which is appropriate, but should be modified in case of people who have disabilities or other things that prevent them from working. Um, I mean, it is a very unfair society, but um, but yeah, I do believe certain things like. Um, health care. I mean, everybody needs health care. You're born, you need health care. I mean, it, it, I mean it, should, it should be a right. It should be guaranteed. But there should be encouragements to, to eat and live in a healthy way and not smoke cigarettes and things like that. Maybe people, you know, who smoke cigarettes, maybe they should have to pay a higher premium. Um, I do believe that um, the government should provide education, but um, that states should also be very liberal about homeschooling. I think Illinois is one of the states that is very liberal because I think there should be a lot of options about that. Um, and um, I think that some things have just gone way too far, like the private prisons. I mean, that, that's, that's insane. I think that leads to great abuse. I'm not sure. I know there's tremendous abuse going on in the prisons. I'm not sure if you know, it's, I assume it's a combination of both the public and the private prisons. But when you put a, a, um, a profit motive into prisons, I think that's crazy. I don't think that um, in terms of the military, I don't think we should have private contractors fighting wars for us. Um, and not only that, but sometimes um, my understanding is like in Iraq, they've been kind of above the law where they haven't had to hold to certain standards of, um, you know, criminal standards because they're, you know, not part of the military. Um, so, I mean, even um, Milton Friedman, I believe, was, would have been against the, um, the private contractors for the military. Um, and, um, yeah, so I think some things are, are, are public, um, and, and I, I think some things should be covered by the government. Um, you know, I question myself, well, should we really have, like, maternity leave? I, I mean, I, I'm not sure what I think about this issue. I mean, I think people, if you want to have a kid, you should have enough money to support the kid. Um, yeah, I believe in, like, unemployment compensation, um, workers' comp, things like that. So I think there, there does need to be a balance of personal responsibility and then the government helping people out as well. Uh, thank you. I'm going next, Andy. I'm going next.
I kind of find it hard to believe that this crowd has been so denunciation, denouncing our current administration. I just recently heard a talk from Newt Gingrich, who wrote the contract for America back in 1993. And the thing is, since Trump's been in office, almost four million jobs have been created since his election. More Americans are now employed than ever recorded before in our history. He has created more than 400,000 manufacturing jobs since his election. Manufacturing jobs have grown at the fastest rate in more than three decades. Economic growth last quarter hit 4.2%. New unemployment claims recently hit a 49-year-old low. Median household income has hit highest lever, highest level ever recorded. African American unemployment has recently achieved the lowest rate ever recorded. Hispanic American unemployment is at the lowest rate ever recorded. Asian American unemployment recently achieved the lowest rate ever recorded. Women's unemployment recently reached the lowest rate in 65 years. Youth unemployment has recently hit the lowest rate in nearly half a century. Lowest unemployment rate ever recorded by four Americans without a high school diploma. Under his administration, unemployment recently reached its lowest rate in nearly 20 years. Almost 3.9 Americans have been lifted off food stamps since his election. The pledge to American workers has resulted in employers committing to train more than 4 million Americans, and he's committed to vocational education. 35% of U.S. manufacturers are optimistic about the future, the highest ever. Since the biggest package of tax cuts and reforms in history, after tax cuts, over $300 million poured back into the U.S. for the first time in its first quarter alone. And as a result of his tax bill, small businesses have the lowest top marginal tax rate in more than 80 years. He helped win the U.S. bid for the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles, helped win the U.S. Mexico Canada's United bid for the 2026 World Cup, opened Anwar and approved the Keystone XGO and Dakota Access Pipelines, recorded a record number of regulations have been admitted, eliminated. He enacted regulatory reform community banks and credit unions, and he's got the Obama individual mandate penalty gone. Yeah. There's a lot he's done to help this country out. And you know, sometimes I don't exactly agree with Newt Gingrich, nor the way our president can be a little bit of a braggart and a bully. But you do have to admit, he is getting the economy moving. Yeah. So did Hitler. Yeah, the, the issue is for whom? Uh, Tim, Tim could, yeah. you, could you tell us where you got that list printed from? That's from the WhiteHouse.gov accomplishments of President Trump. Oh, please. Oh, no. please, please. Is that a humorous site? Please. Is, that, is that like Saturday Night Live? That's, that's straight from the White House website where I got that stuff. That's just something that's from Kelly Conway, expert in lion statistics. All right, our speaker gets our final words. All right, guys, thanks for having me back. Uh, I always have a good time when I'm here. Uh, Bastiat acknowledges that, yes, government is force. Yes, they have tons of force, including bombs. That's megaton after megaton of force. Scandinavian countries do have robust welfare programs for sure, but they also have market economies. Uh, Sweden has no minimum wage and voucher systems for education. Public schools are indoctrination centers who produce ill-informed citizens. They, if public schools uh, can, uh, produce informed citizens, why do we have Trump in the White House now? Uh, my my uh, esteemed colleague Ed Rutledge, Ed Rutledge wanted me to remind folks that uh, uh, government uh, is not only force, but it's also a large, large. Uh, a large f fraud, uh, you know, as well. Commits a lot of fraud. Um, sorry, I wrote chicken scratch a little bit, but uh, I think I got your main point. Uh, my esteemed colleague Joe Kopsick wanted to remind uh, you folks that private visitation can be done a couple ways. Couple ways. One through uh, brought about by state direction, 
and one for getting the state out of the way and just letting the people do it. Uh, yes, Bastiat never explained how the, the, the formulation or structure of a system of law. He just explained uh, what the law should and shouldn't do. Um, so that's why there's no answer to health care or, or anything like that. Um, Trump has run up high deficits and added to the national debt. That's not going to be good for our economy. Um, Charles's libertarian friends seem to be arguing uh, from authority, just citing the law. I would recommend your friend just say that free government shit is legal plunder instead. Um, also, railroads were built from land, plundered from the Native Americans. I hope Charlie makes that point in his presentation. Um, uh, Trump, Bush, Reagan, not libertarian. I don't know why you guys think they are, but they're not. Uh, yes, we should get rid of uh, the Department of Education because government loans has inflated the cost of college. And, uh, and uh, you know... It's, it's made higher demand for, for small classroom space, thus increasing the cost of tuition. <laughs> free health care. Um, uh, Ellen made a good point about free health care. Uh, if we're going to have free health care, then we'd probably have to put limitations on what you can ingest into your body. That doesn't sound... Uh, I'd much rather pollute my body than have free health care. Uh, <laughs> private prisons are not really private because it requires a basically an exclusive contract with the government. Um, and the only thing really private about it is its operation. It's not like, hey, but I mean, private prisons also uh, lobby for the continuation of drug prohibition, so they're, uh, you know, they suck in that regard. Um, I am meeting with some friends uh, tonight at a bar at Armitage and Mozart, just west of California. Yes, Charlie, you can get there by the CTA if you hop on the California bus. Um, so there should be plenty of parking in that area. Uh, I also may have lost my wallet. So uh, please buy me a drink if you could. Uh, they're decently priced drinks, and I can make some interesting trades for a beer. Uh, thank you again, everyone. I hope to come back, and I hope to talk about what kind of great, uh, what kind of creatures are we by Noam Chomsky. So thanks, Jonathan, for the book. Thank you, everybody, for having me back, and uh, I had a blast. Thank you. Gavin Lasalle, Andy. Gavin Lasalle, Andy. Okay, one final note, uh, I'll make this announcement every night from now on. The number one site you can find out what's going on in the world is Common Dreams. CommonDreams.org, and it's loaded every day of good stuff that's not junk like the way you see on television. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week. Oh.